I'm going to give a couple of minutes for people um, to, to trickle in. Um, I'm Lauren Guido, and I'm 2013 to 2014 alum. And we're here with Jeremy Hymans, um, who's our speaker today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping when people are coming in. Um, we really encourage you to rename yourself. Um, so you can kind of go to the three dots um, kind of at the top of your video um, and uh, add where you're coming from. So what country you're dialing in from and your pronouns if you prefer um, that as well. Um, we also really encourage you to react to what the speaker is saying um, with emojis. So, and if you just go to the bottom right, um, you'll see reactions. Um, so for those of you who are dialing in, because I know that people are dialing in from around the world, which is very exciting. Um, for those of you who are just finishing your day, so it's maybe early evening or evening, um, how about give me a, a heart emoji? I will do that as well. Uh, six o'clock and it's very dark here. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and for those of you who are joining, who it's just the beginning of the day, you're just waking up, um, give me a thumbs up um, emoji. Fun. <laughs> Lots of thumbs. <laughs> um, so you are really welcome and encouraged to ask um, and submit questions throughout um, the course of this one hour conversation. Um, and you can do that on Slido, which is this interactive um, Q&A app um, that we're using. Um, and you can find the link to Slido in the chat function. Um, and we really hope to answer all your questions the next hour. But of course, we only have one hour and Jeremy is a phenomenal person and has a great story to share. So we might not get to all of them, um, but you're welcome students to ask those questions um, and reflections in the survey that we'll send you at that. Um, and lastly, turn on your cameras. I know that um, we're not all in the same room, but let's make it kind of feel like that. Um, give a, a cozy um, feeling um, to, yeah, um, to make the conversation, yeah, more exciting. Um, maybe we'll give, we'll all, it's, it's three minutes after the hour. I think we should um, just kind of kick off. Um, so um, I know that this program or, um, this particular session um, is open um, to guests um, and anyone besides, um, in addition to the students that are part of the academy. So I just want to give a quick overview of what Global Citizen Year is and, and what it does um, for those who don't have the context. Um, so Global Citizen Year is a nonprofit um, forging a new educational pathway um, to launch leaders into the world um, that the world needs right now. Um, and I had a chance, as I mentioned, um, to do Global Citizen Year back in 2013 to 2014 in Ecuador. And I'm part um, of a cohort, um, we're an alumni um, network of over a thousand alum from around the world. Um, of course, the pandemic hit um, back in 2020 and Global Citizen Year did a phenomenal pivot um, and it was able to create the Academy, um, which is a virtual um, program on the same pillars um, of the Global Citizen Year Fellowship. Um, and so the program or the Academy brings together 17 to 21 year olds um, through an incredible leadership as a, as a practice curriculum, um, bringing together students and mentors um, from various backgrounds, um, including over 80 countries. So that's really phenomenal. Um, and the Leadership in Action series um, that you're joining us um, today for is part um, of that academy. Um, so let me just introduce me, uh, myself a little bit more and then I'll get to Jeremy, our speaker. Um, so I, know I just keep on seeing people trickle in. Um, so I'm Lauren Guido. Um, I'm originally from the Great Lakes, um, Ohio um, in the US. And I did my Global Citizen Year in the Amazon. Um, and I really think that it really equipped me kind of with the leadership um, challenges and perspective that I really need um, to look at a, a world um, in a the different way. And it really created a different pathway um, for me 
and I, I don't I don't think I would be where I am today um, without my my global citizen year. So a big thank you to Abby for um, putting her life and soul into this. Um, and I now live in Oslo, Norway. Um, and I work for an organization called Zinteo that works with systems leadership, um, helping equip um, uh, global executives um, to, to um, solve some of the biggest challenges of our time with commercial muscle. Um, and one of the first people that I heard about um, when I joined Zinteo was Jeremy Hymans, um, our speaker today. Um, he had been awarded the Inspire Leadership um, Award by the Performance Theater, which my organization puts on. Um, so, so amazing to have kind of our worlds collide. Um, a big welcome, Jeremy. Um, you're dialing in, I believe, from New York. Yes? I am. So good to be with you all. Um, so Jeremy's... Um, leadership journey kind of goes back to when he was eight years old as a child activist um, in Australia. Um, but unfortunately, we only have one hour together, so I'll have to give you some highlights um, from his, his background um, before we dive into the conversation. So Jeremy Hymans is the co-founder and CEO of Purpose, a B Corp um, headquartered in New York City with six offices um, or um, six offices around uh, six continents that builds and supports movements uh, for an open and just habitable world. Um, he's also the co-founder um, of Get Up, an Australian political organization with members um, uh, with more members than all of Australia's political parties combined. That's phenomenal. Um, he also is the co-founder of um, Avaz, the world's largest online citizens movement with over 50 million members. Um, and he was named Fast Company's most creative people in business award. Um, the Guardian is named in the top 10 most influential uh, voices in sustainability in the US. And the monthly has called him he might be the most influential Australian in the world. Wow. Um, and he's also the co-founder, co-author of New Power, uh, which is a book praised by the New York Times as being the best window in, um, I've seen into the new world. Um, I love your book. Um, I've read it twice. I give it as gifts. I'm obsessed with it. Um, <laughs> um, Yes, so I, again, thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to kind of dive into our questions. Um, keep on seeing uh, people trickle in. So let me just do a, another reminder, those who missed it, we'll have the next hour together. Um, and following the conversation, we'll have a 30 minute discussion with just the students. Um, refer to the chat function for Slido, which is where you can ask your questions. Um, and please make sure that your camera is on, um, particularly when we pick on you to ask your question um, so we can spotlight you so you can ask it directly to Jeremy. Um, and I really also encourage you to react with emojis um, that we tested out before. So, um, so Jeremy, um, what are maybe three words that really kind of describe how you're feeling and how you're kind of coming into this conversation um, this morning for you? Well, Lauren, it's, it's firstly just like so great to um, see such an incredible group of people. I've, I've admired Global Citizen Year for a long time. Uh, I think I must have met Abby for the first time, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe even oh, wow. okay. close to that long, maybe not quite that long, but you know, COVID time enlarges everything. But, uh, you know, I think I'm feeling um, really hopeful uh, about this conversation and also really excited for the dialogue with all of you. Um, you know, I think uh, we'll do a bit of discussion about my story, but I'm like super interested to hear from you guys as well, because um, I, I suspect there's quite a lot that I'm going to learn from you all. So. Um, so yeah, Lauren, I'm, I'm ready when you are. Great. Um, so I would actually love to, to start from the very beginning, um, back your, in your childhood. Um, so your, your story is very interesting. Your parents are two Australian um, immigrants. Your mom came from Lebanon in the 60s. Your dad was born in an attic in the Netherlands, escaping the Nazis. Um, 
I mean, you're in like, um, like most um, parents um, or, or your, your parents, I'm sure and their experience really shaped um, your worldview. Um, and I, I love this, um, this saying that you've, you said in a couple of your interviews where you said that um, you didn't have a sport, but your sport was politics when everyone else's was football. Um, Cause at eight years old, you, um, you became a child activist and you were traveling the world um, meeting prime ministers and Nobel laureates. Um, so, so my question is, can you give us a bit more context um, in what sounds like a very like self-directed um, and creative childhood? And I'm particularly interested in kind of the power dynamics between kind of your, your immigrant parents and the world that they were creating for you um, and the world that you were creating for, for yourself um, through your, your own activism. Mm. Great, great questions. Right? Really uh, incisive uh, questions. Yeah, I mean, my background, you know, I think obviously shaped me in ways that I was sort of somewhat aware of as a kid, but have reflected mm. more on as a as an adult. Um, you know, I think taking each of my parents in turn, I mean, I think my dad's experience, as you alluded to, was, you know, really formative. So he grew up in hiding from the Nazis the first uh, 18 months or so, a little bit less than that of his life. He was, he was in an attic. He was born there in Holland, um, where a Christian family had taken his family in and hid them. And so uh, it was an extremely dangerous um, environment and they were extremely lucky. Um, there are lots of stories from that childhood of this narrow escape of my father the day that the Gestapo came to their street and knocked on half the doors on the street but missed their door, right? It was, it was that close. And the to imagine, I mean, you know, we have diaries from my grandfather and, and, and some really wonderful oral history from my grandmother on this, just the anxiety of, of, of that, but also the incredible bravery of making the decision when they were called up to go to the camps, to go into hiding um, and the risks that everybody took, that they took and that this family took to try to keep um, my, my family safe. So, so that was very formative. And I think what my father took from that, which I realized really, um, really shaped me was, you know, he didn't take that and say, well, we have to get very tribal and this is just about protecting us. It was very much about looking outward and saying, mm -hmm. you know, actually what happened to me could happen to anybody. So he really devoted his career, um, you know, to, he made documentaries for most of his career. Um, and those documentaries were often about the plight of other people um, who faced sort of racism, discrimination, lots of those dynamics in Australia, he did a lot of work on the um, dynamics facing Indigenous Australians. And so that I really admire about him because he did take that experience. And the big lesson he imparted to all of us was this is a universal thing, right? And universally, we have to, um, we have to do that. And so, you know, well, the thing that I perhaps didn't realize at the time was the ways in which that story being so powerful, so vivid, you know, I remember writing stories about it as a child. Um, there was a particular story that was very famous in the family of how, you know, um, they had to, he had a, a pacifier because they had to make sure that this baby in this attic wouldn't make noise that would be heard by the neighbors. And wow. um, the day he spat the dummy was this whole family story of like trying to deal with that. That I think in retrospect also made me aware that history is not simple and linear and that even though I grew up in sort of Australia in Sydney in the suburbs which were not a place you know where genocide loomed um, at least for for, for me um, the um, the way history could could play out was very embedded in me and I think that shaped my activism because I think it made me as a kid, um, aware that that life and that societies could take a very dark turn and it made me want to do something about it and when I grew up when I was very young it was still the the cold war the end of the cold war but it was that period where you know there was still there's a lot of anxiety around a nuclear war and a nuclear arms race and I think I took that and 
with my father's experience front of mind, decided to become an activist, um, you know, on those issues out of a mixture, I think, of idealism and probably anxiety, right, born of that. And then, you know, briefly, my mother um, grew up in Lebanon um, and also very much had this sort of interesting experience. And so when I was a kid growing up in, in Australia, you know, mum with a really heavy, thick accent. Australia is a very, um, in many ways, it thinks of itself as very multicultural, but in a way it's extremely monocultural. So I felt very, um, I felt very much like, like an outsider in some ways in Australia as a immigrant kid um, um, with, um, you know, with that dynamic of these first generation immigrants um, who were relatively new to Australia. So that was really interesting. And her experience also, I think, shaped me a bunch. I, I, I grew up with French and Arabic in the house and this sense that the world was bigger than the place that I was, um, was important as well. So a lot of my work from the very early days was global, I think, in part because of that sense that, um, you know, that the, that the world was bigger than, than my, my neighborhood in Sydney. Sure. Wow. Wow. Um... You, you've also said that you kind of you, you were 12 years old, but were looking at the world like a 40 year old. Um, you kind of had this 40 year old mindset. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that and how you kind of took maybe that mindset um, and how you were able to kind of transition um, from kind of your parents um, growing up? to kind of the University of Sydney um, where you did your bachelor's. And I think it's particularly um, you know, relevant for the students on the call. I mean, they're, they're 17 to 21. They're making these big transitions um, as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so uh, sorry, can you repeat the beginning of your question? I think I just missed the thread. Sure. Um, so, so like many of our students um, are um, 17 to 21 years old and yeah. they're making kind of a big transition. Um, I would love to hear a bit more about kind of how you, you kind of, um, cause it sounds like you had like such a blueprint um, to your life. Okay. Yeah, um, got it. Having had your like whole activism, you know and you're like had this 40 year old mindset when you were 12 <laughs> years old yet at the same time you kind of were very young and then transitioning mm -hmm. kind of to to university and kind of this whole new life that you were also kind of creating for yourself. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure it was a 40 year old mindset as much as it was a 40 year old um, <laughs> kind of communication style, if that makes okay. sense. Um, and I think there's a big difference between those two things, right? So I, I, I definitely had a an uncanny ability at that age, which even mm. now looking back on it, I'm like, this is kind of strange to sort of sound quite adult, you know, and, 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 and so, you know, I would be on TV and I would talk about these big global issues and I would do it with um, a polish and a confidence and a precision that was not typical of 12 year olds. And, you know, I, I still remember the thoughts going on in my head when I did that, right? And it was sort of funny because I'd be like remembering the little missteps or the things I felt like I could have expressed better and so, you know, it was interesting. That part of me was always there. And I think I was always thinking about, I was always thinking in a strategic way about how to land my points, how to have the most impact, what was going to, you know, that was just always how I worked, right? At the same time, I think the downside of that was I, the 40-year-old bit that was maybe problematic was I was always living in the future. Right. So I was a 12 year old, but because I was on TV and doing all of this weird stuff, you know, I was every, there was so much pressure on this version of my future self that everybody mm -hmm. was expecting. Right. And so I think in some ways that was um, that was not helpful. Right. Because I was just thinking already, well, what what would you know, what what do I need to do to set up for this this imagined future, which I think was actually a bit limiting as I got older. And so I think as I transitioned to these different phases, you know, I had that period where I was kind of like this quite prominent child activist, like you might call me a much less successful Greta Thunberg, um, <laughs> but uh, with worse technology at my disposal, as I've said. Um, but also, um, you know, I think as I got a little bit older, you know, obviously it was also then in that period, 
um, moving away a little bit from just being so different to my peers. And as mm. you said, crafting this totally self-directed path that like was in a sense of my own creation, right? To wanting to be a little bit more conventional, a little bit more my own age. You know, I think I was the kind of kid who got along better with adults than other kids at a certain point. And I think that evolved, right? Mm. Um, as I went into um, being, you know, an undergraduate and my priorities shifted a little bit and I became um, just, I, I had a desire, I think, to be a little bit more normal, actually, um, you know, in that period of my life. Um, but was still very much a creature of the meritocratic systems that I operated in, which I'm sure is something that many of you guys can relate to. You've all obviously been successful and gotten to this point where you're in this program and doing really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that those systems are, are both very useful at propelling you forward and giving you a path, but also quite limiting, right? Which is one of the things that I admire about Global Citizen Year is it's sort of about escaping that system in a way for a year and um, getting off that treadmill and what, what happens when you do that, which we can talk more about in a, in a moment, I'm sure. And I had my Global Citizen Year sort of later. I did it between the first and second years of my graduate school. And I regard that as a very defining year in my life. Mm, can you tell us more about that? Mm. So yeah, so I'd been kind of, I did my undergrad, I'd start, I'd, I'd had this like, I'd, I'd been lucky enough to get a scholarship to go do grad school at the Kennedy School over at Harvard. Mm. I, 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 I had some time to kill in between and I worked at McKinsey. I was like ticking all those boxes, right? It was like, I was the, you know, I was the Pete Buttigieg uh, you know, it's like this meritocratic kid. I didn't have the military background. I never would have pulled that off, you know. But, you know, there was, there were all of the things. I did all of the things, right? And I was bright and I got all of the academic accolades and la, la, la. And I think at a certain point, I was on that hamster wheel of progress, you know, um, but felt like there were parts of me that I hadn't really dealt with um, that I needed to, that all of this, hamster wheeliness, which I'd done everything like first and young and early, you know, mm. I was at Kennedy School at age 22, which is pretty young um, for that course. And so anyway, I, one of the things for me was about figuring out my own sexuality, figuring out that I was gay and like dealing with that and kind of known, but I hadn't really dealt, dealt with it. So that year um, I kind of decided to like stop and really like do that. Um, that was important personal work that I needed to do. And it also meant dealing with my family and the homophobia of my family and all of those things that had come up, you know, some, sometimes some of the dynamics of, of having, uh, you know, uh, parents from societies, um, particularly Lebanon, that were not uh, the most progressive um, on this stuff, although none of the societies that we were operating in at that time had a particularly progressive view on that. So there was like a lot of work I had to do and that year off, it wasn't really a year off, but it was sort of a year where I charted my own course. I, I, I left Harvard, took a year, went back for my second year of my grad school. That was a pivotal year because I was able to do some of the personal work that I had neglected and reset my priorities a little bit. And that really then changed the course of the rest of my 20s, where I was probably, I did a lot of really wild, interesting stuff in my 20s, um, work-wise, but I didn't have um, the same mindset in a way that I'd, mm. I'd maybe had um, for the years prior. How did that kind of um, I love that you talk about kind of getting off the treadmill because I think that's um, that that's what really kind of um, global citizen year kind of did for me was I it was a, it was a time to kind of just sit back and realize okay you know it's it's up to me as a person I don't have to follow what everyone else is doing if I want to make an impact if I want to um, be the person I really want to be I have to, it's it's going to be me who who does that it's not going to be anyone else these other masses um so that's I think that's really powerful to have um to have done that as well kind of going I think before we kind of jump um into um the different initiatives that you have founded I would love to dive a bit more into kind of how you have been able to kind of use institutions um kind of to build credibility 
yet not become um, kind of institutionalized, something that you have kind of talked about before. Okay, you've, you've mentioned that you've worked at McKinsey, where you went to Harvard, um, you spent some time at um, Oxford. You were really kind of interested in understanding kind of the lens of, of, of what people kind of, um, the future politicians of the world or of um, the US, what kind of lens they were looking at or kind of through, um, or through McKinsey, kind of how business people were looking through, looking at the biggest challenges um, that our, our world, world faces. Can you elaborate um, kind of a bit more about that and how kind of you see the power and the ability to speak the language of the people you're trying to persuade kind of without um, ha allowing them to maybe um, influence you and your view um, of what you call new and old power? Sure. Yeah. I mean, look, so I think looking back on the arc of what I've done, it was probably inevitable that I was going to end up forging my own path, right? That's what I did yeah. as a kid. It's what I've done for almost all of my career. Um, and it's consistent with what my dad did as a documentary filmmaker, independent in that mode. Every documentary was like a startup. You know, it's interesting, my brother and I have had this conversation a lot because he is a portrait painter and he created this completely unconventional path that like kind of doesn't really exist in the 21st century anymore, where he paints these grand portraits by commission, like a Renaissance artist of like the queen. And, you know, he's like painted wow. like all of the most senior members of the royal family and all this stuff. Totally unconventional. He doesn't operate like most modern artists. He has a completely different path. So there's a lot of interesting commonalities. Now, the, the period of time in my 20s, my early 20s to mid 20s, th where I describe, I describe it often as like trying on a bunch of things for size was incredibly right. valuable to me. Um, and so what I mean by that is, you know, I kind of dabbled in lots of different worlds in relatively quick succession. You know, I did the McKinsey thing. I had a period of kind of being more academic. You know, I sort of started what would have been a PhD at Oxford. I wrote a bunch of like very wonky um, papers that were sort of for the OECD and international institutions in that period. That's one of the things that I did in my, in my time in Paris when I was, uh, had my year off. Um, I, you know, did that work. I, I, so I tried on sort of academia and the kind of world that more of what, you know, I think of as kind of policy wonk world. I tried on the business world um, uh, and, um, and a bunch of other lenses. And I think what that showed me, what that gave me was two things. So one, and the UN was also a whole other world that I kind of inhabited in that period. I'd always been very interested in international organizations. I think what that, that all that gave me was um, two things. One was an ability to say, these things are probably not for me. Like mm -hmm. I knew that I needed to inhabit some of these big institutions to know I didn't want to spend my career at a McKinsey, right? Or sure. in a big organization, playing the politics, being a cog in the wheel, moving my way up. That wasn't really the right fit for me. And, you know, nor did I want to be an academic where I would be more on the sidelines of action, right? I, mm. I, I realized through that that I wanted to be an activist rather than a reflectivist. As my thesis supervisor, the wonderful Nairi Woods at Oxford said to me when I told her I was leaving, she said, you know, the world probably does need more activists and fewer reflectivists. Um, so even the use of the term reflectivist tells you something about that world, right? And so, yeah. you know, so, so, um, but what it gave me affirmatively was an understanding of the language and the lens on the world that mm. each of those groups have, right? Um, that, you know, the business world, McKinsey is good for that because it gives you like a very wide aperture. Like you see different industries, you see different, you know, um, the, the technocrats, the academics. And that was valuable because as I did more things in my life and my career, I have been able to be somewhat effective in shifting big institutions from the outside and in mobilizing needed resources from those institutions. And I was able to understand enough about their like lens on the world and the way they speak about the world that when it came time to persuade those groups, I knew how to do it, right? I had the basics. 
Um, and that's been incredibly valuable at purpose, you know, in the work that I do and have done over the last 15 years, where I do operate kind of between worlds and between sectors. I don't really inhabit any one of those worlds definitively, but I, I operate in a way where I can, I think, usually be pretty credible with each because I understand enough about their incentives and their worldview. So that I think was very valuable. And if I hadn't done that, and I had just been a lifer doing what I do now, you know, if I'd just done the activism stuff, the kind of outsider activism stuff, I don't think I would have been able to do all the things that I've done in the way that I've done it um, without that period of five or six years of in rapid succession trying out different things. And so I, I do recommend that to people mm. as an approach at the sort of stage of career and life that many of you are about to enter. So without kind of taking on the identity of maybe what you you ultimately want to do, but kind of, yeah, try on lots of different hats uh, and these these coming or the first, I guess, your your 20s or so. I think that's a really, um, that's a good piece of advice to kind of understand the mindset of, of the people that you're trying to influence to make a big impact. Um, and it's hard not, you, you have to kind of be in there for a bit in order to get it. You can't get it completely from the outside. Um, does that make sense? I, I, I do think that's important to know. You need to know what, um, what drives people, like what the kind of incentive structures are for them. Um, uh, or, yeah, at least that's kind of what I'm experiencing kind of working sort of as an activist from the outside. It's, it's really hard to understand kind of what the motivations of kind of senior you know, executives are, kind of what's the kind of the trade-offs that they're looking at? Why can't they just um, turn off the taps tomorrow, for example? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I see some questions kind of coming um, in uh, the chat. Um, um, what about uh, Yamil uh, Eich, uh, call, uh, dialing in from Berlin? Um, you have a question um, about kind of anxiety um, and about kind of the, the future. Um, uh, feel free to come off mute. Uh, you can ask your question. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, Hi, Hi, Jeremy. Thank you so much for Hi. Um, being here. Um, yeah, so my question was because um, I feel like a lot of people, especially young people, I hope you're doing good, um, especially young people have a lot of anxiety regarding their future, especially climate anxiety, um, mm. looking at climate change. And then my question would be, um, Jeremy, do you see yourself as a pessimist or optimist? And depending on that, how do you deal um, with negative thoughts um, or pessimistic thoughts um, regarding your future or maybe also the future of the general world? Oh, that's a great question, Jamil. I think, um, firstly, I can really relate to the anxiety thing, right? Like that's something that I, as I said, shaped me early on. I think you can't be the son of a Holocaust survivor without inheriting that, um, that feeling. And, um, and I think it did drive me as well on my early environmental activism, right? So we, we called it the greenhouse effect back when I was a kid, but like, you know, I was really worried about it, you know? Um, so how do you manage that? I mean, look, I think the way I dealt with that was I, I, I just tried to do something about it and that gave me a sense of control. And, you know, while we know that that's um, not uh, a, a complete answer, I think that anxiety can be very motivating um, and in, in very positive if it drives um, activism. The way to make that manageable, I think, is to try to retain both a sense of idealism, right? So I think for me in my life, my whole life, I've never tried to become too cynical, right? I've always wanted to keep that kind of glim glimmer of idealism alive, even when the circumstances are bleak and I'm naturally an optimist, right? I was um, joking about this like yesterday. I'm an optimist, which means I'm never on time because I always believe I'm gonna be, you know, like somehow like uh, this trip's gonna be faster than the last one, right? And so, you know, that's a good thing in, uh, you know, and, and, and annoying <laughs> for the people around me. But the, but the point is like, I think keeping a sense of idealism and optimism um, and, and, and tuning into 
the moments where you see people's agency being unlocked, right? Like in my career, it's like the person who goes, the, the grandma who goes to the climate protest that you helped to set up or something, right? Those kinds of moments can be very inspiring, right? And anchoring to the stories of individual change and how people, you know, you can't just do it all at this intellectual level. You have to reconnect all the time to like the people that, 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 um, that you're working with and for, and, and that can be helpful in, um, in offsetting the anxiety. I think also do, doing things with other people rather than doing them alone. I think most of the best stuff I've done in my career has been in some kind of collaboration, deep collaboration with others, right? Um, you know, I have done some things more or less as a sole founder, but I found that the best stuff I've done has been with other founders right, um, where you share the emotional and psychological burden with them um, of the ups and downs of, uh, of starting something or of trying to um, tackle a really challenging um, sort of uh, prognosis for an issue, which of course is what we're all dealing with on climate. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, amazing insight. Thank you so much. Um, I see just one other question, um, about, or another question popping up in the chat from um, Kevin, who's asking mm -hmm. about kind of um, parents um, and kind of expectation setting. Kevin, you're welcome to come off mute and try to. There you go. Hello. Hello, Hi. can you hear me? I yeah. think so, Hello. Kevin. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I wanted to ask, Jenny, when you were taking Jenny in the right how was the parent least like, supporting you through your activist lifestyle? Were they backing up or they were kind of moving away from uh, no supporting ideas? I want to know if they were actually supportive, but if they were not, how will you be able to deal with this kind of situation? Thank you. Yeah, great it's a question. great question. Sorry, go ahead, Lauren. No, I was just gonna say that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, I think I, you know, the relationship between my parents and and all of this very self-directed life was complicated, right? So on the one hand, I think they were um, very supportive, very present, right, for all of that very involved, which was very valuable. They didn't, however, want me to completely lose myself to that, which I understand, right? Um, I was getting a lot of attention as a very young person. I was in the public eye a bit. They wanted, they kind of tried to limit some of that, right? When they felt that it was getting um, too much or it was going to undermine um, the focus on my schoolwork or on just the ordinary kid stuff. Um, and so that was a bit of a point of tension too, because like I wanted to fly further um, in some ways and they kind of wanted me to uh, sort of stay grounded. So there was something in that tension that was, um, that was interesting. But I, but I also think, you know, um, I clearly, uh, there's a lot of this self-directed um, activity you know, the psychology, there's a psychological element to it as well of like wanting to forge my own path, wanting to perhaps be a little free of aspects of my own upbringing that felt oppressive, right? Um, and the, um, the sexuality thing, I think, was a big factor in retrospect, right? I knew I, I that, you know, that I was not like the other boys and therefore um, needed to create a world for myself that protected me from, um, from the indignities of that, right? Or the, the potential discrimination I would face. And the way I did that was very much being very independent, very self-sufficient in many ways. I mean, you know, um, and, and that I think was, um, was partly a response to that sense that I would need to do that in order to survive. We're getting very heavy now. Does that answer your question, Kevin? Yes. Awesome. Yes, that's my question. Um, kind of building off of what you were just saying, um, 
Okay, so you're charting your own pathway and kind of creating your own, yeah, creating your own path. But how did you know, um, I guess, did you have some type of kind of guiding star um, or kind of your own purpose besides knowing that you wanted to be um, an activist? What was kind of your own kind of manifesto or kind of playbook? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I had a manifesto or a playbook as such, but I think I was pretty clear on what I believed, you know, and that was pretty important. So I, I always had like a lot of clarity about my own personal politics and values, right? Mm. Like I, and I think fundamentally the, the dominant element of that was this kind of humanism, internationalism, this belief that like, that every like that we needed a more equal more just world that that um every life was equally valuable and out of that flowed a whole bunch of very obvious implications right mm -hmm. um for the way i felt the world should work and so that really animated me i think a belief that and also a belief that we could solve problems globally and collectively and that was really important to me you know i had a real belief in in that right um so the issues that animated that early on were, you know, nuclear issues, climate change, but also poverty and, and issues like that. But it all had the same underlying value kind of conviction, which was like, we're only going to solve problems if we do it globally. You know, the, the world is, you know, the, the injustices between countries um, were very motivating to me as a dynamic. Um, and, you know, I was never like an extreme radical in a funny way. Like mm -hmm. I was always pretty pragmatic and my politics haven't changed that much. I was always clearly very progressive, but I was never like the revolutionary as such. I was never the person who thought that my role was going to be the flamethrower, right? Although I was sure. prepared to do some of that and some confronting of power. That was important to my strategy, but it was not, I never saw myself on the spectrum of actors being the one who was going to be the most radical. Mm, because, um, you did, because you felt like you need to build kind of the collective um, power or just because you, you, that just wasn't your politics? I think it was more that it's just, it was not where I gravitated to as a strategy, right? Sure. So I felt like I could be more effective if I preserved an ability to engage with different actors, including some actors that were not natural allies or, so that I always was playing that brokering role. I mean, I was always, it was always very clear where I stood and like anyone, you know, would, would look at me and my politics and say, this guy is of the left, he's, but I, I never, you know, it's a different strategy to be the person you know, um, you know, the rainbow warrior person at Greenpeace, you know, um, doing the direct action and the kind of activism that I did and do. But at the same time, you've built, um, you know, big movements like Get Up, um, like I mentioned before, the Australian political movement. Um, um, how were you able to kind of, I guess, build this collective action that you're in collaboration that you're talking about? Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience or students in particular who are interested in helping build movements um, to, to the big challenges that um, our world faces. I'm just curious kind of how you went about that. Yeah, I mean, look, um, that's a, obviously a very big question. <laughs> very loaded and, question, I'm sure. It's and very... it's sort of the, my life's work in many ways, <laughs> like, figuring out how to do that. But, you know, I think there are a few principles. I mean, definitely, um, you know, in Australia, when I started Get Up, which, you know, has grown to become a, a one of the most significant kind of social movement organizations in Australia, the, I think we really understood who, we understood the people that we needed to spark this movement. And those early, what we would call connected connectors, right? Who were going to be the people who were going to shape this? We knew what they, you know, we knew where they lived. We knew what their values were. We knew that there was there there were uh, there was kind of a coalition of the willing that was out there. If we strung some of these constituencies together and unified them with a strong narrative, 
Um, and that's what we did, you know, with Get Up. There was a very right wing government in Australia at the time, led by a guy called John Howard. He had on issue after issue, you know, kind of taken the country back 20 years, right? On climate change, on relations with our indigenous people, on immigration and refugees. We just did the work of helping to create a narrative and an envelope that people who shared a bunch of values, their entry points might have been different. You know, one person might have been really motivated by climate, another person might have been really motivated by treatment of refugees, but those people have the same values. So yeah. we created a brand, a narrative, and a place for people to feel connected to each other um, in a movement um, that was partly oppositional to him, but also partly a positive expression of an alternative vision for the country, right? Mm -hmm. And so that work was a combination of strategy and tactics, you know, like all things. That's a great segue to uh, one of our questions um, from Fatima from Pakistan, um, who's asking about kind of connecting, collaborating with lots of different stakeholders. Fatima, can you come off uh, mute? Awesome. Um, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So. My question was that you mentioned about moving from, you know, business and then academia. And when you move, so the question was when you move from like one sector to another, are there these, there are these um, problems that you face in connecting and collaborating because it's a very different environment. So how did you like, we'll say, moved into those environment and started connecting with people because, yeah. Mm. Well, you know, I didn't always feel at home in those environments, at least initially. And, you know, I think, as I've said, my identity was always as a bit of an outsider or certainly not someone who was like the in the first row in class, who was the, the I'm not like a joiner as such by, by, by disposition. I'm always like, okay, I'm going to like be part of this, but I'm also going to keep one door out because I'm not sure I belong or because I'm not sure I believe in it or whatever, right? The, the, there's always that relationship for me between, especially with big institutions. So, you know, I think um, I, uh, you know, I, I think I probably had a lot of privilege as well, you know, Fatna in many ways. Like I was, I went to good schools, you know, in Australia. I was the product of like a meritocratic system. I didn't have money, but I had, good education and so that gave me confidence in those spaces right that most kids wouldn't have right um that didn't have some of the privilege that i had so even though i felt like an outsider and my experience was a child of immigrants and in australia in the schoolyard i felt very different in really profound ways and experienced racism and all sorts of other things i also had real privilege right um, and so by the time I got to, you know, McKinsey, you know, I'd already been, you know, academically at the top of the class and, you know, done all those things. So I, I had a lot of, I had a lot of like inherited confidence from that. And not everybody gets those opportunities. Thanks, Fatima. Um, what kind of recommendations do you perhaps have for people who don't have those institutions um, behind them, but do you really want to create change and build momentum? Yeah, you know, I, I think things have changed a little bit since my era um, in a good way. So I, I do think that, and I, you know, I write about this in, in New Power, the, the book, and in our work there, I think one of the things that's changed is those institutions were such gatekeepers you know, even, even in my early 20s, right, 20 years ago. So in that, those institutions were, so, were such gatekeepers and they were so unchallenged in a way, the Harvards, the McKinsey's, whatever, the Oxfords, all of those boxes, uh, you know. I mean, it's, those institutions still have a lot of sway now, clearly, right? Although many of them have been exposed as, as highly problematic, right? <laughs> as we all knew at the time as well. But, but I also think what's interesting is that you know, you can also forge your own path the way I did in many ways um, without them. 
uh, more. You know, you can build a huge following on social media and have a direct audience to hundreds of thousands or millions of people without any of those institutional imprimaturs, right? You, you, you are better able to create self-directed possibilities today than 20 years ago. Like the sort of stuff I did 20 years ago was so much more of an outlier than it is now, where I'm amazed by what young people are doing every day um, to forge their own paths, right? That are so diverse, that their own publishers, their own fundraisers, their own social entrepreneurs, um, uh, et cetera, their own activists, that has multiplied massively. So I guess what I'm saying is I think there's, for good reason, more cynicism about those fancy brands and institutions that certainly my affiliation with those in the early stages of my career was useful and helped me to parlay that into the things I later did, starting Get Up, starting at Avaz. I think people came to me and took me more seriously because of those things, even though they probably shouldn't have, right? But I think today there are other markers that have emerged which um, are less um, narrow, which I'm sure many of you are benefiting from. And so I do think that like those other paths um, and the, the variety of paths have really multiplied in ways that are very positive. What are some of those markers you mentioned? Well, you know, I think you can, again, privilege and power are still universal um, dynamics and constraints. So I just want to mm. own that, right? It's not like sure. anyone can do whatever, but, you know, crowdfunding, uh, which I think is a, a problematic thing in many ways, but is nonetheless a very powerful tool. Um, I think the ability to self-publish and self-broadcast has huge implications for your ability to get things started, to create new ideas, to influence thought without access to the bully pulpit of the mainstream media or traditional media. Um, I think uh, I think activism has also been democratized. I mean, what Greta did, I could never have done, you know, because she could she really helped to spark a truly global movement with no power whatsoever, right? Mm -hmm. She she was not the daughter of a famous person. Her, she was her not... mom's a famous opera singer. Oh well, there we are. So I take that back. No. <laughs> That's fascinating. I didn't realize that. Um, still, maybe opera not a not a huge uh, not a huge lift in the climate activism space. I'm not sure. sure. Okay, that yeah, I'll take that. So it sounds like there's some privilege there that I maybe was not tuned into. But like, but nonetheless, like starting a global movement from Sweden, you know. Mm. And again, to be clear, she shouldn't take all the credit for that because there have been many, many leaders that have emerged out of that movement. And I'm sure some of you are in this Zoom. But those things are all um, more possible than they were 20 years ago. Sure. Yeah, that is that is true. She has she has Instagram. She has the media um, or her own her own social media to kind of build her own platform, um, like so many other um, activists as well. Um, okay, we're we have about seven minutes left. Um, so if there are any additional questions, please type them out uh, in uh, Slido, and I'll try to get to them. Um, but I guess in the, in the meantime, uh, Jeremy, I'll ask you. Um, you know, you because you founded Purpose um, back in 2009, um, strategy consulting, creative agency, social movement incubator. You work a lot with kind of purpose driven brands um, and organizations to build um, yeah, purpose for their customers. Uh, we've had to, we touched on this a little bit before, but I would love to hear a bit more about kind of your own purpose and perhaps kind of how it has evolved, not just from when you were in your 20s when you took your gap year, but perhaps kind of since the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, as well as kind of what, um, kind of, I guess in parallel, kind of what does it mean for you to be um, living a meaningful life? So it's um, just two parts. You know, I, I feel like, like everybody, I think I'm struggling with some of these questions right now. So I could give you a canned answer on that stuff, Lauren. Um, yeah. That sounds satisfying, but it would be canned. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it's really hard right now. Um, we, very we're in this, well, Yeah, we're in this very chaotic environment. There is so much... Um, clamoring for attention 
right? But not necessarily sure, sure. that much purpose, you know, in in the small p sense. And I'm very aware of that and attuned to it. So I don't really play in that clamoring for attention space these days, kind of the way that I maybe did earlier in my journey at Purpose. When we were building Purpose, it was just so much to build and so many people we needed to engage. And that made so much sense. And I think I feel like now I've done a lot of that and I've seen all of those rooms and I've, you know, I got some nice awards, right? Like the one that you, your organization gave me, lovely, but like doesn't feel like it's necessarily creating or advancing a kind of deeper purpose, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, to pursue that. And I see a lot of people around me who are doing great work, but but who are so wrapped up in that clamoring for attention in this chaotic information environment that we're in. And I see that as very distracting. The people mm -hmm. who spend all day tweeting, you know, nothing wrong with Twitter, but like if you're trying to build something in the world, if you're something other than a writer, you know, or a, a social commentator and all you do is tweet. And I see many good people, including leaders of major organizations doing this, yeah. you might have lost the battle for focus and attention, right? So I, I feel like I struggle with that as well. And I think about, well, how do I deploy my own voice smartly? Um, you know, what do I build in the world that is not duplicative? And a lot of that has come from building purpose as an institution. And much the way Abby has devoted, you know, a, a lot of her life and career to Global Citizen Year, it's really admirable when people like Abby do that and really commit to something, mm. right? Um, which is not even always the most glamorous choice, right? Um, I'm sure people came and offered Abby lots of fancy jobs over the years and she stayed and committed to Global Citizen Year sure. because, yeah. you know, so I think that is like admirable, right? Um, and I'm sort of navigating that as well. Like how do I want, what is my relationship to my institution in over time? Um, you know, what, what else do I want to do in my life and how do I want to operate? There's no easy answers right now, especially in this environment. No one has, yeah, no one has the answers. Um, I know we only have three minutes left. Um, we have two questions. Um, well, well, there's lots of questions um, in the chat, but I only can get to one. And I'm just going to um, read it out loud because we won't be able to um, have the person um, ask it. But Kurt is asking or saying, um, many would admire what you have done. And for many of us, you carry the ideals we strive for. Um, but I'd like to know what you wish people knew about you, um, maybe in a phrase or two. <laughs> that like, is it on your CV, for example? Mm, it's a great question. You know, I think I pride myself on not being too earnest and being quite playful in the way that I approach my work and my life. Mm. And I've tried to really imprint that on the organizations that I've started as well. Um, I think that's really important. And I think it's part of how to address the question that was raised earlier um, about dealing with the complexities and anxieties of the current moment, right? Yeah. Um, is you've got to stay, you know, earnest, uh, stay, stay playful and not too earnest. And I, I appreciate a joke. You know, I appreciate even a joke that's a bit inappropriate. You know, it's kind of important to have a kind of levity, right? And uh, especially in among change makers, sure. you know, God, let's not all train our fire at each other and kind of, you know, try to be the purest and holiest and, you know, most perfect. It's going to kill us if we do that. Like we need to like stay it's a journey. Engaged. What? It's a journey yeah. we're all on. A journey. And we need to be both kind to each other, but also not engaged in what is a typical habit of, of progressives from time immemorial, which is to kind of mm -hmm. outdo each other with purity and spend all of their time, you know, criticizing each other rather than focusing on the larger, the, the larger um, obstacles to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're at the hour, but I, um, is it okay to ask you just one short question before? Oh, go for it. Okay, so just lastly, to round off the conversation, um, if you could tell your 18-year-old self one thing you know now, but wish um, you had known then, what would it have been? Uh, I know we talked about this from a lot of different angles, but just to, to sum it up. You know, I think the number one thing is, um, was, was what I said to you earlier, which is don't live your life 
for some future self career thing mm -hmm. you know like i think i was so much always calibrating for the future and mm -hmm. i think uh i think it's easy for me to say that now you know i've done stuff i I've, I've, I've climbed different mountains that felt like they were important mountains for the future at the time but but i do think that my my big thing to my 18 year old self would be like don't uh you know don't like be captive to um don't be get be captive to your future self Mm. right figure out what you need in the moment what you need yeah wow well thank you so much I and mean, we covered a lot of ground um today and i'm sure there's you know a mil there's a million more questions um that we could learn about um and your journey um but thank you so much um jeremy for making the time to share share your own journey with us um really appreciate it um i know we're over um so for those students, please um, stay on. Um, also, before I get to that, um, in the reactions, um, please give uh, Jeremy some emojis to show your love for this awesome conversation. Yay, hearts! Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the emojis. <laughs> what a way! What a way to start your uh, Tuesday morning. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so awesome. Good luck to all of you in the great work you're doing, and uh, happy to hear any more thoughts or feedback you have after the session. Yes, so the students, you can fill out the survey, which we'll put in the chat shortly. Um, guests and staff, thank you so much also for joining, um, but you're, you're welcome to um, log off now. Um, there'll be a student only 30 minute um, discussion um, starting now. Um, so thank you everyone, Bye, nice guys. to see you. And then, um, you know, how has your idea of meaningful life evolved over the last nine months, weeks? Perhaps let's dive me into your kind of reflections on um, Jeremy's ideas. I know um, Rakash or Rakshak, um, you had some great reflections um, on Robert Frost um, and kind of leading your own pathway. Um, perhaps if you're if you're willing to share with the group, I think it'd be really interesting to hear um, your reflections um, for everyone. Yeah, sure. So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, and uh, uh, to everybody over here. So, like as I told earlier. Like, you know, uh, one of Jeremy's point, you know, it struck me a lot. Like he told, even he told that, you know, you come to this earth to be yourself and not anyone else. So even I was struck by Robert Frost, you know, we read a poem when I was in grade nine that, you know, if the, you know, I don't remember the poem, but the lines really struck me hard, you know, that I, I have miles to go before I sleep. I have miles to go before I sleep. You know, so basically it is that, you know, God has sent everyone of us to this world by assigning a task you know you whatever tasks have been assigned to you you have to do that and i believe you know do that task okay and let others get inspiration from that but not let them copy you you know and you just be yourself in this world you come here to be yourself do whatever you have do whatever you want to do you know, the others, you know, they'll just get inspiration from you. And that's the thing which got struck me a lot. You know, then after this, uh, when I was in my 11th grade, I started with an NGO um, in my city of Kolkata, India. So this NGO basically focuses on uh, teaching young uh, kids uh, living in streets, in, you know, in slums, and uh, who some, you know, whose parents even don't earn even a dollar. To, to for the family, some are orphans. So we started with a concept that, see, we have to educate them. We have to provide them food, clothing, shelter. And we even raised voice to the government. You know, actually the government, they just make false promises like, that, like we'll do this, we'll do that in the election manifestos. But it, when it really comes to take mm. the, you know, to taking this thing to a ground level, they actually aren't there. So we raised our voices to the government. You know, we even said that, see, the education system also needs to be changed. You know, we have to become future citizens. You know, the youth of the country is the future of the world. So the education system must also be designed in such a way that we really get to know and really have the opportunity to change the world. 
so no so we came up with this concept with the to the indian government and you know last year in 2020 july 29th they came up with a new education policy so we were acknowledged with that you know according to the new education policy of the government there were several changes which came up so yeah i'd say that we are really proud of mm. ourselves you know since we were working with the government for the past 4 years that we have to now do this things so we even went to the us we took some of their education systems uh, big characteristics we went to norway which is supposed to be which is still you know uh, like which is where i'm calling from, from. <laughs> wow that's really well summed up and i think that really goes um along the lines with like the the thread with um that jeremy was talking about with you know activism kind of going um you know being yourself um taking taking you know whatever context you're in and in in building momentum building movements and definitely um yeah you have a great start to that um um perhaps someone we haven't heard from um yet um uh, i uh you're welcome to kind of come off mute um kurt you seemed uh like you had a, a lot to say when we were um briefly chatting before um any kind of quick reflections i know we're, we have only seven minutes so we'd love to kind of get as many reflections from um people so maybe keep it pithy <laughs> yeah uh sure thing i actually really wanted to ask him or like ask him about a quote so tom daily said a uh, once ago that we have a tendency to overcompensate to hide the fact that we are different and he was saying that in the context of him being gay for example and so i wanted to in terms of having a meaningful life it really occurred to me how it is we have to have inner reconciliations i guess and i mm -hmm. i wanted to i wanted to ask him what that meant what that would mean for him to have that chance to reconcile within himself things that maybe prior he couldn't and also um also i guess that there are many people who aren't born with the environment that he was in as yeah. such the issues that he was presented at a really young age i learned about the apartheid for example just a year ago um prior to that i never knew about that term and i was really surprised because um everyone would consider myself um red and very um adamant and passionate about a lot of things but my chamber of information did not let me access to that and it's such an important thing right so i was wondering what would be an advice of his to people who don't have that kind of access and hmm. what would be his insight since he's he writes about it he writes about power for example and um in the new world i guess yeah hmm yeah it's a really good perspective i hope you're able to uh, i think you can ask that in the survey um with bill relay the the I think questions is that is that correct staff or you'll share kind of additional reflections that people had yeah i mean maybe um grat gratitude but could be something that maybe if you could weave it into your gratitude <laughs> yeah absolutely. i did i did Else, I'll okay, just find great. a way to talk to him one on one. Maybe. <laughs> you go, you know? um, yeah, you can definitely just like even met like just LinkedIn them. I don't know if you guys have LinkedIn, but like I like I'm constantly just you know I see someone who's really interesting. Um, like you know I hear or read a book or something, and I just message them um, on LinkedIn. Um, you can just ask them for like 15 minutes of their time. Um, and you have to, it's good to have like something specific to ask. Um, um, but like everyone has 15 minutes to spare. Um, so definitely don't shy away from, from doing that. Um, anyone else? I would love to hear um, from someone maybe who hasn't asked a question, um, who has something maybe on the tip of their tongue. <laughs> Fatima, I think you're on mute. Fatima, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, yeah. I was talking. I just, I was talking to myself and waiting for someone to speak. <laughs> I can go ahead. I oh, can I'm go always ahead. doing that. <laughs> so yeah, it's one of the things that I really connected with, like the last thing that Jeremy said, it was don't be captive of your future self and live mm. in the moment. And I kind of connected it with the purpose we were learning in the first month of our, you know, global citizenship classes, that your purpose is supposed to be something that 
you achieve, you are able to achieve at the moment like right now and mm. him mentioning that he was able to you know he was an activist at the age of 12 let's say and that he was able to do and so he when like he was able to achieve that at the moment and i kind of thought of, about that a lot even in classes and now i was like you know re- reminding myself of that that my purpose is not supposed to be something that i can achieve 10 years from now mm. and something that's a big goal and after that i don't have anything to do so yeah it was very nice to hear those things yeah. but it's here and now it's um i think it can but you know your purpose can evolve you don't have it's not like set in stone um and yep. i think that was that that was interesting that he you know he was able to go in mckinsey he was able to kind of do all these different things um yet he all kind of stayed true to himself yet but kind of the environments that he was in he was kind of able to kind of adapt himself um yeah um what about Ish- ashina am i pronouncing that correctly i would love to hear from you um but either from you know the reflections from Jeremy or you know, in general how your your view of a meaningful life has evolved in these last couple of weeks um i actually had another point to make it was that um how jeremy i had a question to ask jeremy was that how he had a positive outlook in everything i mean mm. at times in life in his life he might have had times when he felt disappointed or he felt hopeless or when yeah. he lost you know his track and we lose track it gets a little difficult to come back on track and how he must have you know kept his dream and vision in the future which i mean i have to really get look at that and find my purpose in life is like fatima my purpose in life was kept 10 years ahead of me and after that i have nothing to do so i have to get back and i learned a lot yeah i mean it sounds like he in a way never had like a complete vision he just you know was able to do i mean maybe what he wanted um and kind of the vision not for himself but maybe for society and kind of you know every every cha- like every interaction you have will kind of um you know turn you a little this way or a little this way um and i think global citizen year definitely i mean at least for me like it made me go like totally this way um in a in, in a great way so i think let every interaction that you have be meaningful um and um kind of develop your your own pathway uh, and kind of yeah let life happen as well i think that's a really good lesson um okay so i i i know we're at the hour do staff do we ever kind of go over a bit or what's kind of the uh <laughs> yeah we can but i think um if people are probably tired um i know a lot of you are calling in from um it's like midnight or 3 a.m. crazy <laughs> um <laughs> any any last reflections or we can sign off um for today no okay well it was so good to be all oh go ahead oh, yes. actually wait we have a quick unmuted like applause for lauren and that was just for your moderator job oh thank you <laughs> thank you yeah it was so fun um yeah it was really exciting to meet you all and kind of get back into the global citizen year um mindset and global citizen year like i said has been really kind of transformational um to my life um and i'm still friends with so many of the people um the the fellows um well i guess the students in your case um from my my fellowship so definitely kind of treasure um those relationships and the I think the people that you meet on programs like Global Citizen Year will really kind of help shape you um and be your kind of um grounding um light or you know it will they will help you keep you grounded i mean there's it's a different kind of species of people so to speak um uh and you really need that um when you want to be a change maker so with that um i hope you have all a good day or evening night wherever you're calling in from And yes, thanks. I hope to see you again soon. Thanks. Everybody. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.